Well, hello, and welcome to our Plastic Injection Molding Parts Clinic, featuring our speakers, John Sidorowitz, our Director of Customer Success, and Glenn Miller, Senior Tooling Engineer. John has been with Eccentric over 10 years, a technically-minded sales leader and problem solver in all things manufacturing. Having a degree in management and a very diverse background, John understands the entire manufacturing process from design to final product and everything in between. Glenn's worked at Eccentric for three years as a tooling engineer and quality control specialist. Prior to joining Eccentric, Glenn spent time as a CAD tool designer and tooling engineer with over 25 years of experience in injection molding. This presentation is expected to last approximately 55 minutes. We have eight parts that John and Glenn will, will be reviewing with an emphasis on surface cosmetics. And we'll try to get through all of them in the allotted time. Please use the questions field on your screen to ask questions during the presentation and our experts will address those throughout the webinar. We encourage you to follow Eccentric Molding Engineering on LinkedIn so that you can stay up to date on our latest blog topics and webinar schedule. Now turn over the webinar to our experts, John and Glenn. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Mark had mentioned, uh, today's focus is kind of on uh, surface finishes, um, and you know things to look out for when you're designing parts and um, you know what we do on on the tooling side and and then look at uh, so the agenda today if you, if you haven't been to one of these uh, is we're going to kind of show a part kind of walk through it uh, describe its use its functionality and not so much challenges that we've come into it uh, come to with the part but um, you know how we approached it to to meet the customer's requirements um, you know, pointing out some of the key features or, or key things that were needed, um, and then answer any questions that you guys have. Um, looks like there's a, a volume issue. Um, can everyone hear all right? Yeah, I can hear you, John. All right. <clears throat> all right, so we'll start with part one here. Um, this is a lens. Um, it's mostly going to be exposed to or, or customer facing. So we had two challenges with this one, um, mainly gating and ejection. Um, you know, where do, where do we put the gate so it's not visible to the customer and how do we get the part out of the mold uh, in a manner where they're not gonna see the, the ejection? You know, um, let's flip over to SolidWorks. So we can take a look at the part and let this load up. There we go. The right, obvious so bad places across the lens itself. Obviously, we can't have anything there. Correct. Now the the part is open close. It was designed that way, um, so we have no external actions that we have to worry about. Um, it does have clip features, um, which we have to account for. Um, but how we ended up, we'll start with the ejection. Um, is essentially going all the way around the rim um, to to eject the part. Now, when designing parts like this, depending on the size, this wall thickness will matter. Um, you know, the the landing area for the ejection to to push off on uh, to eject the part. And in this case, we, we did a simple edge gate um, on the, the side here, because uh, this was going to be below surface and not exposed uh, to, to the customer or uh, forward facing. So it was really at this rad and this top surface. So everything below this line was, was hidden, which is why we ended up with uh, the edge gate. I mean, pretty straightforward design. Um, as Glenn mentioned, you don't want to eject anywhere in there, but um, if you don't have enough ejection, um, you could you know, damage the part coming out or the part may get stuck in the mold. I don't know, Glenn, if you've got anything else to add to this one. No, uh, just, uh, you know, it's a simple enough part, uh, open and shut, um, but, you know, the challenge was, of course, to put ejection in the gate in locations that would not uh, hinder the, the cosmetic forward-facing value of the part itself. Right. Uh, John, we have a question. Um, yeah. 
what diameter are the lens ejector things? Uh, these would have been, um, let me grab one here. Probably 062 or 047, something like that. Yeah. These are 046. So with, with our tools, we can get down to uh, 032. That's the smallest nice. you want to go. Um, Next question, um, where are the lifters to make the undercut? There are actually none. Um, it's not a true undercut. It's, it's captured in the line and draw. So it's between the core and cavity. Let me just isolate the part again. So the cavity will come down and shut off on the top of that clip, which is the undercut feature. So there actually is no need for a lifter in that area. Correct. So Correct. your parting line would be, you know, along this edge here. Right. Was there a, pro a problem with plastic sticking across the large lens area? Typically, no, if you have enough ejection all the way, going all the way around. Um, and there's enough draft. Now, if there was zero draft along the inside, um, that could be an issue. But the part was designed with, with a decent amount of draft inside and out. So that, that does help. That amount of draft will let that release off fairly easy, which it, which it did. And the other thing to note on this part, it's a really consistent wall thickness, um, which is going to dictate some even material flow. Um, if we had some thick, thin sections, it's going to restrict material flow, and you may end up with flow lines, you know, through the top of this part. You know, by gating on the one side, we're going to get flow all the way across the the top of this part, and you know, since there's no restrictions, not end up with any you know seams or anything where the two material fronts come together. Um, so, yeah, I definitely don't want to gate anywhere near that main surface. Like, uh, you know, a lot of parts you can subgate into a pin or something, but that would create definite issues with gate blush and other concerns on that face. So, edge gating this was the was the way to go. Mm -hmm. All right, let's flip back over to. PowerPoint here. And if you've got questions that come up, we can always go back. Um, there, there is one that just popped okay. up. Uh, if the thickness was varied to increase in the middle of the part, how would you accommodate with gating and injection? Probably approach it the same way. Um, if it was thicker in the, the center section here, I think that's what you meant. I mean, that's going to allow material to flow more even around the across the top than around the outside. Yeah, it'd be different if the outer edges were thick and the lens itself was thinner. That would restrict the flow across the part and probably cause us some fill and cosmetic issues as well. But the part was designed very well and it was designed with consistent wall thickness, which is what you want to see on an injection molded part. Yeah. That, how do you? That, sure. how do you oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say the material is going to go to the the path of least resistance. So, like as Glenn was saying, if the the outside walls were were thicker, the material is going to flow all the way around the outsides first, and then meet on the backside, then backfill across the top, and then you may end up with uh, unsightly, like yeah. Yeah, knit the, lines, the, but at the least knit lines if and at the worst you could have a gas trap burns and other other issues that are going to be difficult to process our way through next question is how do you trim a tab gate on a diameter well, those gates are generally made um, size wise so that they come right off they basically snap right off clean um, you, you know, obviously there's going to be a mark, a witness of that gate diameter, but uh, you keep it small to fill the par just enough, and that gate will snap right off there and leave a very small blemish. And if the, and if the blemish turns out to be more than what is expected, uh, you can add notation to the job and, and go back through and trim that um, more flush if necessary. Uh, there, there's always a way. Right. 
All right, the next part is gonna be another lens. Um, similar situation. Um, and this one had a couple different finishes. So uh, let's flip over and uh, get this part. Part number two. So here's the part here. So the, the most critical part of this part was the center. Um, this is what required the high polish. So it was a different finish on the other areas of the part. <clears throat> so we can kind of see, let me shut this off here. So in this one, we didn't have to really restrict or we weren't re really restricted on the ejection. Um, so let me shut this bottom off so we can see where the uh, ejection is coming in at. So we were able to actually eject off the this surface. We were just limited to this lens area here. Um, so the customer was doing some post-processing. I think it was painting around this. Um, so this was the only critical area. And again, we ended up with an edge gate because this was somewhat buried into what it was going into. But again, even walls, even you know, consistent wall thickness, um, nicely drafted. I think this had uh, at least two degrees on it. So. Design. And we have a question going back to the first lens. I don't think you need to jump, jump back there. But, uh, was a plastic yeah. simulation done on the first lens? Um, well, I guess simulation can mean a lot of things. Um, we do a, a standard mold flow here. Um, just for fill uh, and potential sink. Um, and see where, where knit lines uh, may appear. But yeah, we, we do that on, on all our, our parts. Unfortunately, I don't have that uh, to show. We have two questions, uh, both of the, the same. What's the, what are the, what's the difference between the green and the magenta pins? The sizes, the size. so the size. we, yeah, we only had so much space in here. We couldn't use a larger ejector pin over here just due to the uh, the space that we had. So they're just two different size ejector pins. I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay. Oh, yeah, someone just said injector or ejector? Ejector. Ejector. And then ask what's the difference? Well, ejector pin means we're ejecting the part off the tool. And injection is injection molding. That's it's two totally different terms. And this is the injection point here into the part from the, the runner system. And then these help eject the part out, as Glenn said. Um, it looks like we still have some people. Yeah, we've got one hearing. person saying I can't hear anything. I'm not Apologize sure. for that. There's uh, there's no other settings that we can change on our side of and others are being able to hear. Uh, but we can't. Um, right, question. Oh, there's another person just confirming she can't hear. Okay. Um, Question, why are so many ejector pins needed for such a small part? Um, this wasn't really a, a small part. Um, I think if I remember correctly, this was a few inches long. Uh, about 132 millimeters long. So it's a fairly decent sized part. Um, fit, it's a deeper part. In, you, 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 you put it in, you don't want to have large gaps between pins and then have the potential for those pins uh, not being enough to take the part off and you start seeing stress marks and pin push and, and other things. So as long as there's room in there, um, 
we we put as many ejector pins in there as as necessary for a size part we're running. Right. Okay. How long would a part like this be in the mold? Well, you're probably uh, I mean, looking at, what, 45 seconds? Yeah, I'd say 45 seconds at most. Another question, how were you able to eject part cleanly when there aren't any pins on the lens? That's why there's so many other pins are around that lens area. So this yep. was the oops, this was the critical area for the customer. So we've got, you know, that's why we've got so many pins around. Now, if we were able to put pins all the way, yeah, you know, in this area, we'd have less around and you know spread evenly throughout the throughout the whole part. Yeah, there's there's nothing on the lens. Uh, the lens data there that's going to make that stick as long as we've got sufficient ejection to pop that off the core. Right. All right. Next part is a, um, a tray. Um, I think this was an acrylic tray. It John, had... Sorry. Yeah. One more question regarding the last one. How much of oh. the 45 seconds of molding is injection and how much is cooling and ejection? Uh, that I'm not going to know. I mean, the, the injection process happens fairly quickly. Um, yeah, the, the ejection yeah. part is, is, you know, seconds, then there's a cool time, then sometimes they have to add a little hold in the press to kind of pack the part out. It just depends on the part itself. Um, but there are like stages within the injection process uh, to make up that time. And then of course the opening and shutting of the press and so forth. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's dependent on the part itself, how long that injection is, the size of the part, uh, gate size, barrel size. So there's a lot of different factors involved with uh, how long that ejects, injects, excuse me. And one more one question. When the liquid material is injected, how is the air in the cavity allowed to escape? Uh, we actually, you know, we add parting line venting which are uh, thin tracks from the parting line itself. And then right at the part, uh, we don't always add the actual small vent at the part itself, because sometimes it's not needed, but we do utilize these venting areas to allow the trapped gas uh, to exit the tool and not create a burn or a short issue. Yeah. Okay. Kind of think of it as a paper thin, uh, like little slot, you know, kind of the shape of a runner, but uh, it's very, very thin, just just enough to let gas out. All right. Um, so this part is um, a tray. I said it was a, I think it was acrylic. Um, it had multiple surface finishes required, some, you know, specific areas that required polish. Um, just due to the design of this one, let me flip over. Um, the ejection is actually on the um, top side. So here's a little bit more. We'll kind of zoom in on the part here. So you can see the part from both sides. Um, so it has pockets and numbers uh, on this side. And on the back side, we've got um, you know some core outs to, to get a even consistent wall thickness throughout the part, or at least for the most part. And the way these were designed is they are stackable. So you can see a, a raised little lip here, and that would basically set in on this side so they could be stacked. So here's a little bit of the tool. Let me, got, where's my cavity? 
Sorry about this. There it goes. So we can see the the actually core side of the part is formed by the uh, the cavity of the mold. Um, and if I shut this off, we can see the the, the gray circles here are the ejection um, on the part. And that was due to um, there was no draft on on these. So if we did flip it around and, and do it how you traditionally would have the uh, the core on the core side of the part, um, there was a fear of these sticking to the cavity side, um, which is not good. So in order to keep these with no draft, um, we had to flip the part and eject off the uh, the customer facing side of the part. John, we've got a couple questions. One. Yeah. Um, can you offer any design tips to make molded text legible? Really just depends yeah. on the size of the lettering or, or perhaps it's a logo area or an image. Um, it really just depends on, you know, the detail and the sharpness and the size. I mean, some of the stuff we can actually cut, other, other items would, uh, would need to be laser engraved, uh, for instance. So it just really depends on the size and detail of the uh, lettering or logo or, or shape. Yeah, I mean, staying away from sharp, um, you know, text that, that has sharp edges or sharp corners. Um, usually that's going to require EDM or, or laser, like uh, Glenn had said. Um, Which can add cost, you know, if it can be cut in with uh, with a mill uh, easy enough, you know, that's obviously a, a cheaper cheaper way to go. Any font recommendation that's less sharp? I'm sorry. Any font recommend uh, recommendation? Something that's less less of a sharp font. I mean, there's so many fonts out there. Yeah. I, it's really going to be, you know, is it tied to a logo? Is it, you know, just a, a warning label? You know, that's a that's a difficult one to answer. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a specific logo that is tied to a brand, I mean, that's going to be more difficult to adjust. Then it comes down to size. Um, but you know, for the most part, if we can't cut it, we can burn it. If we can't burn it, we'll we'll send it to laser. Um, there's there's going to be a way to get that engraving in there. It's just to, dependent on the design itself. And following along that line of questioning, is embossed or debossed lettering easier? Um, I can't honestly say that either is easier. It really depends on the situation and you know the size of it and if there's some draft on it and things like that. Right, yeah, so I mean, there's minutes. no. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, John. Finish. Uh, I lost my my thought. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. A few moments ago, you had mentioned, uh, uh, I think, uh, trays being stacked. Someone asked, when you mean stack, can you put multiple trays at the same time? No, this was a designed by the customer, so these trays remain made to stack whatever they're doing with them. So I don't know if they're they're loading these with things and then you know they can be just stacked onto each other. I'm not sure if that's not in the mold. Okay. What surface finish options are there and how do they affect the cost? Um I mean the service or the surface finishes that we offer um range from you know, a, a heavy bead blast up to an A2 polish, um, almost lens-like. It's not going to be like a true lens, but clear, uh, see through it. Um, there's, I mean, multiple textures available uh, out there. Um, I mean, we we work with a texture house down the street that can match textures. So if there, if you have a, a part that you want to match to, they can take that, scan it, and develop a texture for your plastic part. Um, so it's really kind of endless as far as um, the textures go. But 
you know, we can do up to an A2 polish uh, on our aluminum tools. If there was draft on the recesses, would you have gone with a different gating or ejection strategy? Yes, because at that point, I mean, it, we there's no concern of the part sticking to the front half. So we would have, we would have tried to mold it the way the part is showing on the screen now uh, instead With of the ejection it. on this backside. <laughs> right. More to the, more of a traditional cavity core open and shut. And along those lines, is there such a thing as too much draft in this kind of application? Too much? I don't think so. I, I, I've never run into that situation, so <laughs> I, I'm going to say no. Uh, draft to draft, you're going to, you talk to a mold maker, um, they're going to push for as much draft as is possible to, and yet still maintain your design and your fit and your function. Can TPU, oh, I'm sorry, Glenn. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Can TPU be laser etched? After the part's molded? I mean, we, we can we can etch the mold and then whatever, you know, the TPU, once we inject it into the mold, will take on whatever's in the mold. As far as post-process, I, I don't think so. Maybe. If you have a TPU part and want to have it laser etched. That I'm not sure. Another question is, what are the colored tabs around the part? Glenn, do you remember what those were for? Um, I mean, they're they're inserts, but to be Honest with you, I'm not sure what we've got going on there as far as the need for that. Unless there's, <laughs> unless there's an undercut feature in those spots, I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Let's, um, and it could have been something, oop, didn't want that. Oh, forgive me, there it goes. Um, it could have been something for later on, uh, possible design changes, or we add in to something in those areas. Um, yeah, perhaps the customer had some um, some etching or some part numbers or something to be added later. Uh, I'm not. I'm not certain. Um, you know what? It might be actual like tray numbers or something could have been. Yeah, so you could see from the side. But right. I, don't, I didn't see it on the part, so that could have been a later on feature. Let me see if I can see anything. Yeah, there's nothing on the outside here that would indicate the need for that. So it could have been something for the future. You add an ejector pin inside the slot on the round surface and fill it completely. What was the question? I'm sorry. All right. Can, could you add ejector pins inside the slot on the round surface and fill it completely? In here, I'm assuming. I mean, I suppose you can, um, but we were able to put ejection in between in the open areas, so there really wasn't a, a need for that. Yeah, and I I don't know what this was for. They could have been pouring something into these, and um, you would have some sort of witness from the ejector pin. So unless it was perfect, I mean, you couldn't have it perfectly to that size, um, otherwise it would kind of defeat the purpose so yeah, i mean if this, if this was a lab tray or something they they want it to be perfect they don't want any extra material in there that could possibly you know get into whatever they're working on if if that's what this was for i mean there can be any number of reasons why they wouldn't want to witness there yeah 
John, you, earlier you said that there was no draft on some of the surfaces. Uh, the question is what surfaces did have draft and how much draft? These didn't have draft. Um, the draft was on the back side here. I, I think it was minimal. I could run the draft analysis, but I've got so many parts open, I don't want it to <laughs> freak out. It could out. be as little as a half a degree, but yeah. it would be enough to release it. And then the inner, those inner parts that we're looking at now have zero. So, and then the outer walls of the part have draft on them. Um, probably, you know, anywhere from a degree and a half to two or three. So. Okay. All right, let me flip over to you. All right, so this next part um, is actually a frame. Um, it's for some portable x-ray equipment. Um, so this was a, uh, moving away from polishes, this was a, a textured finish. Um, it looks like a pretty straightforward part, but there's actually quite a few actions on it. Um, we kind of worked with the customer because all the all the poles were ended up from the outside of the part, which means multiple witness lines. Um, so we worked with the customer on trying to move everything to the inside of the part where it didn't really matter because it was hidden and away from the customer. So let me pull that part up here. Um, this is part four. So this is a, a fairly large part. Um, I'd say about 15 or 16 inches by 12 inches. So this is just kind of a, a cutaway of the tool. Let me uh, focus on the part here so we can just look at it. All right, why isn't it moving? Let me give it a second here. John, while you're waiting on that, um, one of our viewers uh, shed a little bit of, uh, of uh, light, I guess maybe has some, has some experience with it. Regarding the last part, said that customers shine light through each well to measure light, so you don't want optical distortion, which is one of the, going back to no. the question about could you have put ejector pins in those, and that's probably one of the reasons why. Yeah, I could be. All right, so just kind of looking at the outside of this part. So um, there's, um, I don't know what you call it, a plate that gets locked into this inside groove of the part. Um, then there's a, another uh, secondary piece that slides in here across and then is screwed together to, to lock it in. Um, so as you can see, we've got, you know, actions that are not in the line draw kind of around the part here here um, and some holes here. So in this case, all these holes had uh, rads on the outside, um, these slots, um, which was going to mean, you know, multiple hand pulls all the way around the part. So customers okay with removing the rads, that way we were allowed to essentially create these holes by the hand loads or the, the actions inside the part. Um, same with these holes and if I exit out of this we'll be able to see we actually only ended up with with one external pole um, so these these hand loads are you can see where the pins coming through to create those holes um, same here and same goes for the other side uh, so the main parting line you can see is about halfway down the part let me go back just to the part here So this is our main parting line. And the only additional witness lines we're gonna see, we'll have like a, a parting line from the hand load here and you know over here. So this, these holes and this corner were all designed to pull in one direction out this way, instead of having one pull this way and a second uh, pull off to the right. But there are three internal hand loads as well. So you can see this this bottom blue one pulls out first. That allows the the two other ones to to come out. So the customer's got a seam line inside the part here, 
in here, and then obviously just the, the parting line around the part. Sean, we've got a, que a cycle time question. Um, how much time did it take, um, uh, how much time did it take a person to pull the part from the mold and get the mold ready for the next injection? Uh, if we're talking this part, I mean, I trying to remember, uh, cycle time on this part was probably a little over a minute, minute and a half. Um, you know, whoever's running it, and this is low volume, obviously in a, a production setting where you're running thousands, you, you wouldn't have a tool like this, but uh, this customer orders, you know, 50 to 200 at a time. Um, so it makes sense not to go with a, with a higher end, you know, fully automated tool. But yeah, this one's probably, I would say minute and a half at most um, to overall cycle time, like door open to door shut. Okay, and follow on to that question, parts like this that have manual processes, um, does the machine sit idle while that is happening? Yes. So, I mean, the, the, the part's gonna be, you know, out of the press for maybe a, a third of that time. So the part comes out with the, you know, the blue sections and this pink section, you know, the operator is going to pull this pink section off first, pull the blue part and the, the center blue part, then the other two, and then load those back into a press. So that might be overall about a 30 second time frame where, you know, the ejection or injection and the uh, the cooling time are, are is the rest of the time. And why choose hand-loaded inserts over mechanical action? I guess in this case, it was, um, you know, tool cost versus, you know, the, the production quantities. You know, the customer is okay with a higher piece price um, versus a higher upfront tool cost. And, you know, to automate this and put lifters and slides and other things in it is going to make a significant increase to the mm -hmm. tool cost, not, not just a little bit. I mean, so the customer has to weigh uh, what these parts are going to be used for and, and the amounts that they're going to run them over a year and then make a, make a financial decision based on that. So in this instance, it made more sense to do a, uh, a manual tool uh, for the number of parts and it still produces a really good part and uh, you know that's what the customer went with. It's someone's asking for some clarification. When you say hand pull, you mean the operator moves the blue and pink pulls them off themselves? And the answer is yes. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, the, the part would eject from the mold um, with these blue and pink pieces in in the part. So um, and they're aluminum and they could be hot. This was uh, I think a PCABS material. Um, so it'll come out with everything and they hand remove these four pieces and then load them back into the tool and, and essentially reset the cycle. Um, the next question, uh, for a part like this, what would be the tool cost difference between having a uh, manual operation or automated? I would say at least a factor of three. Yeah, I was going to say triple or quadruple. Again, you know, a, a really tool like this, yeah. I'm going to say a tool like this might be, you know, twenty to twenty-two thousand dollars because of the size of this part. Um, you know, going into lifters and, and everything else. You know, you've got one one slide, um, and then these lifters. Yeah, you're probably looking, you know, fifty plus thousand. Um, John, I think you mentioned the, the material that was used. If you mm -hmm. repeat that, and then also uh, they're asking if there's any cooling lines. There is. I mean, there is. Uh, I don't think it's in here. I think I pulled that part of the cat out, but there is cooling through the mold. What material did you say this was? The part material was a PCABS. Tool material is aluminum, QC10. How are the hand? Uh, let me see. How are the pickouts typically retained in the mold? Uh, this is the. They're typically loaded into the core side 
Um, you can see there's some extra meat here. And I don't know if I, let me see if I can pull that up. I may have wiped that out of here. Uh, yeah, I did. But yeah, I, there's usually some extra meat on the hand loads. Um, you know, if they're deeper ones, we've got guide pins uh, to help guide them in. Um, and then it just ends up being uh, almost like a friction fit. In terms of strategy, what was provided by the designer and what was the responsibility of the manufacturing engineer? I assume at this case, at this point, it would be the, uh, the mold designer. Well, I mean, when we get parts, um, you know, on the front end, we try to understand, um, you know, the the requirements or the expectations of the part. Um, that way we can give all that information or anticipate, you know, um, things like, you know, this orange piece trying to minimize the, um, the witness signs on the outside of the part. You know, automatically when we hear polish or texture or anything other than like a standard finish, we're, we're assuming it's a cosmetic part. It's going to be customer facing. Um, so that's when we start thinking about that before we, before the, our tool designers even see it um, on the front end. Um, so then we take that and, and quote based off of that. And if we have to get design involved, we will early on in the process just to, to make sure. But uh, by the time it gets to our tool designers, it's it's pretty much ready to go. Yeah, how many how many shots can you get from this aluminum mold before having to rebuild? Um, I, well, obviously, well, this mold is going to different from from others because it's really going to be material dependent. Um, you know, PCABS it really isn't an abrasive material, but if it was say say a 50% or 35% glass filled nylon, it might be a little bit different story. But um, I mean, we've gotten close to 250,000 shots out of some molds, um, and a lot less with with abrasive materials. Um, with eccentric, we we guarantee our molds for life if you go with a low volume production tool. Um, so if the tool does wear or breaks down, we will either repair or rebuild that mold. And on this particular mold, um, you know, the main cavity and core box are going to hold up pretty good. It's it's the uh, the manual pieces that are in and out of the tool every cycle, every shot that'll end up uh, wearing first. But as John said, these these tools are capable of running upwards of, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, really just depending on the part, of course, but uh, yeah. All right, um, we still got a lot more to go and uh, I know we're we're gonna be short on time. So um, let's just maybe get through the parts and we'll try to answer the questions as we go. Um, so this next part is a, um, it's a high-end device the customer wanted, um, you know, to, to look Apple-esque. Um, so it was, a, a, you know, a high polish on this part. Um, it was a polycarbonate and, you know, seam lines, witness lines, anything like that were, you know, gates were, were a big no-no on this part. So let me get the, the tool up here. This is part five. All right, so I kind of took off the, the the cavity side of the tool so we can kind of see the part kind of in the core. And again, this one was a lower volume part. So this this chunk of, of CAD here is actually a hand load. Um, but let's uh, look at this part. And we had a question about lower volume. What do you, what do you mean as far as lower volume? For us, I mean, if you're going to go with with something that's that's manual, a manual tool, it's less than a thousand pieces a year. Uh, anything above that, you you want to try and automate. Um, if you're running, you know, a thousand at a time, um, I know high volume is going to mean you know a little bit different to to you versus um, to us. Maybe you know we consider high volume, you know, fifty thousand pieces a year. Uh, where automotive, it might be two or three million. So
So this is the part. Um, so we have a lot of ribbing, um, a lot of important features. Um, the way they designed this, it was a press fit. Um, there was no screws. They didn't want to see anything from the outside. So this is the uh, the inner part, which is the more complex. Uh, there was a top piece that press fit onto this side and then another uh, on the bottom side here. Um, so it looks like a very busy part, um, but as far as the guts go of the part, like the core side, um, it, it is open close. Our, we just have one huge undercut, which is this area here. Um, and again, we couldn't have any gates, you know, seam lines. It, it, this surface had to be pristine and perfect. Um, so let's do this and let me try this. So you can see this is the hand load, um, this blue section here. Actually, I don't want to do that. Just isolate this. Why is this acting funny today? There it goes. All right, so, so there's actually a, a small little undercut within the part as well for this, but due to the part design, it, it actually kind of just pops out. Um, it's, it's not much, um, so we had to be careful when we were demolding. Uh, again, this was a, a kind of a startup customer who didn't have a lot of upfront um, capital for, for tooling, so. Um, But yeah, this design allowed us to, I mean, we had to work with the customer on, on some small things, but this is where we ended up. Uh, and the, we ended up gating in the back of the part um, you know, through here. Turn that back on. So we had this, this edge here where we gated into. I don't know if there's any questions on this one, Mark. I figured this one would have a lot. Not so far. Just one comment okay. about SolidWorks. No. <laughs> it is, it's good, but it always works funny. Uh, hey, we do have another question. Uh, what kind of pressure did you need to fill uh, this part? Um, I don't recall. Um, yeah, I don't have that, unfortunately, in front of me. I, it, you know, we... We try not to run anything really high, um, so it, it wasn't low. But yeah, I don't have that, I apologize. Is it difficult, John, uh, or costly to polish complex surfaces like that? Um, I mean, this one isn't really too complex. It's a continuous surface. It's when you get into, if we go back to that, say that tray part, where you've got the vertical walls, you, you know, the, the flat bottom, you know, walls are, are easier than, you know, side walls. So it's when you get into to multiple small surfaces that are, you know, at different angles, um, you know, this part is, is pretty smooth. So it's, you know, it's going to be a little bit easier. Yeah, that just turns into more of a consistency issue. And it really, this part would not have been a problem at all for one of our high-end uh, bench hands out there. It's just a matter of benching it consistently and, and not staying in one place and creating, you know, issues with the part. Uh, as John said, anytime you've got uh, 40, you know, 90 degree corners and, and benching up and down on an edge and you can run into issues, but this, uh, this face, this, uh, this entire show face was, I'm not going to say it was an easy polish, but it's definitely not something. Uh, yeah. We uh, just had to, Pay close attention to the text area, but other than that, um, so this 
But other than that, yeah, it was pretty straightforward. How many hand loads are needed for consistent molding? And I'm gonna I'm gonna assume they're asking, you know, how many how many sets of, of hand loads? It's I mean you you can have one part or one hand load on a part. And I mean, we've had uh, a, a very complex part that had 23. Um, it, it, that one actually required us to kind of shut down the press for, for 10, 15 minutes because of the demolding time and, and to get everything going. And that's with an extra set of, of hand loads. Um, so it's, if, you, if you're gonna need an extra set of hand loads, you might as well just automate the tool at that point. Um, because it's really going to be the same cost. Okay. Uh, what type of plastic is it? This was a polycarbonate on the uh, that polished part, and that's the other thing to keep in mind too is you, is your plastic and the surface finishes. Because um, plastics are funny; they you know they're not all the same as far as uh, accepting surface finish. So you know a, a polished tool. You run an ABS through it is not going to look the same as a polycarbonate. You know, polycarbonate's going to take the uh, take that polish a lot better, and you'll get that nice glossy surface. Where an ABS, a standard ABS, is going to be, it's going to have, uh, it, it's not going to be glossy um, at all, even though the tool is. Um, you know, textures, you know, materials are going to you know look a little bit different. Say a nylon versus an acetal versus a, a in ABS, it's going to take that texture just a little bit different. All right, um, where am I? Okay. So we got this uh, this bezel. Um, this is part six. Let me get the part loaded up here. So this one was a, a textured, uh, required a textured finish. Uh, let that load up. So we started out with a light blast and ended up going with the, with a heavier grain. Um, reason being, we have this this rib that that runs along the. Uh, kind of the outside of the bezel and what was happening that rib was was creating a, a bleed through um, with the lighter blast you could actually see a, a witness of where that rib was um, I tried to grab a part so we could have some pictures to look at um, and that's just caused due to you know essentially being a thick section of material if you imagine if you start here moving all the way to the top surface um, so what we ended up doing is just going with a really uh, a heavier grain, um, and uh, that ended up fixing the issue and, and masking uh, that kind of bleed through. Unfortunately, the the customer we had enough, you know, we have a lot of draft here. Um, that's one thing to consider too is the the level of of texture on your parts. Um, you know, if you're going with a really heavy grain, it's going to require a lot a lot more uh, draft, you know, it could be three, four, five degrees in some cases. Okay. Um, so, John, just for for anybody who's not familiar with Eccentric, we have uh, one question uh, that came yeah. up on the last one. Um, does Eccentric do the molding in house or only the tooling design? We do everything. Um, yeah, we, we do everything under one roof. Uh, well, actually, we've got two facilities. Um, so we will build and, and run the tools here between our two facilities in Michigan. And I think we're almost running out of time, so we've got just a couple other questions. Do different plastics require different gate designs? Yes. Um, you know, uh, glass filled or, or um, you know, fiber filled materials require a, a little bit different gate style than, you know, say like in a, a standard ABS. Um, so gate size and type will will matter depending on the plastic. If a thick rib is needed, are there techniques that can minimize the sink? 
Well, processing wise, we're, we're limited to, to what we can do to, to actually get rid of sink. I mean, it really does come down to a, a thick mass of plastic creating that sink. So um, if we're talking about backside ribs or screw bosses or other things that are uh, attached to the back surface, um, the rule of thumb is no more than 60% of the nominal wall of the part. Uh, that's your that's your good design starting point to try to minimize any potential uh, sink issues. Right, and Glenn, I think the next question is a little bit related to that. What does thickness have to do with showing on the outer face product? Well, what ends up happening is if you let's say you have a part that's you know fifty thousandths thick. And then on the back side of it, you have attachment features, ribs, screw bosses that are, you know, same nominal size or even a little thicker. Perhaps they have screw bosses with gusset ribs that they want a lot of support structure. It, it depends on the part, but that thicker mass of plastic, um, what ends up happening is the parts cooling, that mass of plastic kind of sucks back in. Now we can attempt to uh, do what we call packing the part out to try and force the material into the cavity as possible, but a lot of times it's not enough to, uh, to combat a, a thick wall section. Um, and like I said, uh, if we run into that, sometimes a little bit of texture on the front face can mask it, depends on the part. Other times uh, we would go back to the customer and, and advise them to you know thin those areas out reduce that amount of plastic which in which will also you know reduce the um, amount of sink that's going to want to happen in that area so it really does come down to the part itself and what kind of features you have back there so john and glenn you guys um as usual great uh presentation of the different parts and the, the challenges that um designers and, and we as boulders have. Um, we have unfortunately run out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we will send a link to the recording of this webinar within 48 hours. If you have any questions about today's topics, please email us at sales at eccentricmold.com. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody.